Rajiv, one question uh, continues to uh, worry me. You know, every, every faith has its ad adherents and they're very proud of their faith. A Muslim will say, I'm a proud Muslim. A Christian will say, I'm a proud Christian. Angela Merkel went and said, Germany should follow Christian values. They were Christian Democrat Party. Uh, David Cameron said that in the England should follow Christian values. They're very proud of their founding faith and the values. But in India, if you come and say you're a proud Hindu, you're dubbed communal, you're dubbed a Hindutva, you're dubbed a right-wing person. Good. Now, what is wrong with the Indian mind that we refuse to accept our own identity, stand up for what we think we are, and why are we not proud to stand up? If you're Hindu, I'm a proud Hindu. If I'm a Muslim, I'm a proud Muslim. If I'm a Christian, I'm a proud Christian. In fact, Gandhiji was asked this question, that, you know, what do you want people to be? I see, he said, I want a Hindu to be a proud Hindu, a Muslim to be a proud Muslim, and a Christian to be a proud Christian. Because that's what you are. Yes. But in India, if you say about Hinduism, you, you are branded. Yes. And why is this branding happening? And w what should we do about it? What is your view? Great. This is a great question because I'm one of the, I'm victim number one of this sort of thing. <laughs> Except that it doesn't bother me. I'm very thick-skinned, and I just give it right back. So it doesn't bother me. But uh, I've studied this whole syndrome. You see, the thing is that we've been, because Hindus are the majority, therefore the target is uh, the, to get at India, to understand India or to, to undermine India or to this breaking up India. Uh, it, is very, it has been very important for the colonial powers to understand Hinduism in a way that would be fragmenting them, making them feel inferior, uh, conflict, conflicts among them and so on. So the, the emphasis on the study of India and the study of Hinduism have, has never been, you know, what are the mathematics contributions? What are the contributions to astronomy? What are the contributions to neuroscience, or the ideas of yoga? It has not been those kind of things, but what is wrong with it? So it's almost like we are the patient and they are the doctor who's going to fix us. So that's sort of the thing. Now, the reason the problem is worse than in the colonial times is that now it is Indians teaching us these things. And these Indians are like zamindars or sepoys that have been trained in a certain place and they're sent here to kind of be the gatekeepers of various forums. Uh, you can see this in media forums, you can see this in academic, intellectual forums, and so on. And I must say I'm very delighted that Bangalore Literary, Literary Festival is the first festival to give voice to Hindus and not censor them. Because, you know, all the voices should be allowed at the table. India as an open architecture should have, has room for all the voices. It's not that the Hindu voice is suppressing someone else. It's just that I'm from a certain heritage and therefore I have a right to talk about it in a positive way without being called chauvinist and all those things. Fascist, these horrible words are uh, imported. Uh, we don't have that kind of a, a, a history of those things happening. We haven't genocided people. We haven't got that kind of a history. But this imported uh, theories Social theories that are imported, large number of them, whether it's Marxism, whether it's Freudian psychoanalysis, whether it's post-colonial studies and all kind of new things going on, are very fashionable. And they have been, they, that is where the youth who are very bright and go to good colleges are sucked into uh, such programs. It's become elitist and the media love such, uh, to quote this, because it makes them feel like they are superior and, they, and so on. So this uh, inf deep inferiority complex that we carry and, and a sense of awe of the West uh, means that uh, we follow what they their lead intellectually. And this means that uh, we are not in a position, we have, are, are the thinkers, the leaders in the social sciences have not been in a position to really honestly uh, excavate who we are on our own terms, much less reversing the gaze and responding to uh, other people. So this, in, this lack of identity and shame uh, and a sense of apo you, uh, almost like you have to start by apologizing uh, is, a, is a very sad, sad thing. Very, I found that 20 years ago, or somewhere around 10, 15 years ago, there's something called uh, uh, Education About Asia. In, it's a magazine in the US. It goes to 20,000 school teachers who teach about Asia. And I wanted to sponsor a special issue on India because they had never in their history featured India. They would feature China, Japan, Southeast Asia. It's, all, it's about Asia, but they never featured us. They would feature the Middle Eastern countries. So we gave them a grant, my foundation, to have uh, features on India. And I was asked to write the introduction uh, to that special issue. And in that introduction, I said, this is like 10, 15 years ago, I said that this caste, cows, and curry 
stereotypes about India are obsolete. And this is a limited view. And the American child, when he grows up, he will be dealing with Indians who will be technological leaders. I said that 10, 15 years ago. And they did not believe that. So I said that rather than being cast cow's curry image that you are teaching, you are handicapping the American because he will not know how to treat an Indian properly compete. and compete. It is in the interest of the American uh, side that you must understand the strengths and understand, appreciate other civilizations just like Americans appreciate themselves. And so the, this, the purpose of this special issue is to educate Americans about the future power that India is and the past power that it has it used to be at one time so that Americans know how to deal with mutual respect. Now it is interesting they took this uh, whole issue they took my uh, my uh, in introductory editorial in the next issue were a whole lot of complaints uh, some by Indians also that this is chauvinistic why are, we, why are we allowing this he should be talking about this problem that problem that problem and you know then I had to respond I was given a chance to respond which is good and so I, I could say that if you look at the issues on Japan, if you look at the issues on China, and you look at U.S., I mean, U.S. grand narrative is called American exceptionalism, starting with, you know, the founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson, the place where Edison and all these people, Wright brothers, it's all the accomplishments of the country. Every child learns these things. And it is not about what a, what a horrible place we are, which, they, I mean, every country has horrible things. So you see, we have somehow, Become, become very full of uh, negatives about ourselves. And we need to turn this around in the same way as a corporate enterprise needs a positive brand. It needs a USP. And it needs to, it needs to show what is good about it, both for its own people and for the other per, uh, part, other, the outsiders who it deals with. And you cannot be successful in a competitive world if you are, if you are confused about what's good about you, or apologetic, or just very uh, full of inferiority complex. So the, the, the control of the Indian narrative in the hands of intellectuals that are mixed up on this is a very dangerous national crisis. And that control needs to be switched. We need to train new people who bring the academic rigor, intellectual rigor, who are responsible, who are balanced, who are fair, and who can present a good narrative.